Hello, my name is Conrad Kuhn, and I will speak about the following subject. Thinking in structures, working as a dramaturg with Robert Wilson. As a long-standing collaborator of Robert Wilson in the field of dramatic theater and opera, I have always been amazed by his special approach to a given subject. Whether it be a classical or modern drama, a production based on a theme to be developed freely, or an opera, the first thing Bob examines or invents is the structure. Here is one example. When Wilson started working on Einstein on the Beach together with Philip Glass in the spring of 1975, all they had was the title, an intriguing title. It was clear that this opera, I'll come back later to what this term means for Bob, was going to deal in some way with Albert Einstein as a seminal figure. Einstein was also a musician. His discoveries about the relation of time and space, known as the theory of relativity, have changed the world, including consequences like the invention of the atomic bomb or the Apollo mission to flying to the moon. That was the subject. Otherwise, no text, no plot, no biographical storyline. The character of Einstein was to be a solo violinist in the pit. The first thing they did was to set up a structure. How many parts is our opera going to have? What duration will each part have? They ended up with a design for the time structure, giving each part a precise length. The first act was to be, say, 42 minutes long, the second one 53 minutes, and so on, with the so-called knee plays in between, short scenes that would serve as junctions between the acts. The next step would be that Bob drew sketches of the set. Phil would then put the sketches on the music stand of his grand piano and start composing. Still no lyrics, libretto or anything of the kind. In fact, at some moments in the completed score, the chorus has just numbers to sing since there was no other text available. One, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Only then Christopher Knowles came into play and improvised text for certain scenes. Cascades of words sounding much like the ones Dada pioneers like Hugo Ball or Kurt Schwitters invented. The result was a show that had a tremendous impact on the theater of the Western world, a landmark production. One word about the term opera. As Bob would say, opera comes from the Latin word of work, opus. That's what theater is for me. When Wilson started creating his first works, they had no text nor music. He would call them silent operas. For example, Deaf Man Glance, which premiered in 1971 and he would quote John Cage, the most beautiful music can be found in silence. At that time, Wilson would decline any offer to stage an existing play. When he met Eugène Ionesco in Paris, after the splash Deaf Man Glance, Le Regard du Sourd had made in France, Ionesco would ask him to stage Rhinoceros. It was only 40 years later that Bob took up the proposal for a production in the Romanian city of Craiova in 2014, I had the privilege to work on. To avoid what Bob would call ping pong dialogue, he introduced the figure of a narrator who was reciting most of the text. Simultaneously, the actors would play the scenes silently. The result would be a verfremdungs effect or distancing effect. To use a term of Bertolt Brecht, who has always been a strong influence for Bob. The same applied for another production I collaborated on, Oedipus by Sophocles. The special challenge was to bring this ancient Greek tragedy to the Teatro Olimpico. 
It was the first roofed indoor theater in modern times built by Italian architect Andrea Palladio in the city of Vicenza. It opened in 1585 with precisely this drama, the set representing the city of Thebes with its seven gates. And this set is still in place. Of course, it's a museum. You're not allowed to come any nearer to it than one meter. On the remaining stage in front of this set from 1585, Wilson staged a completely new version of the Sophocles play. Since the Palladio Theatre is built after the model of the ancient Greek amphitheatre, it was decided to open the production in the Teatro Grande of Pompeii, as it has been dug up out of the ashes of the Vesuvian eruption in 79 AD. The stage has the same shape. In order to avoid the dialogues, I proposed to reverse the dramaturgy of the tragedy. Instead of Oedipus finding out about his past bit by bit, questioning a variety of people, ping pong, we told the story of the myth chronologically in the order of the events, starting with his childhood, the oracle foretelling that he was going to kill his father and so on. I relied only on the, ori on the original text of Sophocles in an Italian translation of the early 20th century without adding a single word. It just wasn't used as dialogue. Again, what Bob did first was determining a structure. There were to be five acts. The duration of each was decided without knowing what parts of the text would correspond with which part. The five parts were put in relation to each other. The first was echoed in the fifth, the second in the fourth, the third being the center. The five acts were freely improvised during a staging workshop at Watermill. Only when the structure had been established, I suggested bits of the text for each scene spoken again by a narrator. The main character, Oedipus, was a dancer. A typical approach designing the structure is determining some of the following features. Is a scene or part in relation to the others rather calm or vivid, peaceful or violent, bright or dark, fast or slow, accelerating or slowing down, crowded or solitary? Is there a deductive process or an additive? In Oedipus, for example, in one scene, the dancers carried folding stairs on stage, building several rows that were later destroyed by Oedipus in a desperate outbreak, the climax of the show. Whereas most dramaturgs, especially in the German-speaking countries, tend to concentrate first on the literary text, the musical genre and specific form, or the historical, cultural, and artistic background of a subject, Robert Wilson thinks in a more abstract way. What he looks into at first is always the basic structure of a theater evening, visually, dramatically, and musically. In Bob's words, many stage directors tend to study only the text, trying to stage a play or an opera from there. In Western culture, as André Malraux has put it, theater, quote, has been drowned by literature. Therefore, it is shocking for the audience if the other elements of theater are being treated as being equally important. Go to see the Balinese theater, the Indian Katakali, the Peking Opera, or the No Theater of Japan. It's all about form. Setting up a structure when conceiving a theatrical production is a creative process of its own kind. Before dealing with the contents, this structure is going to be filled with. This may seem arbitrary, but it's always linked to a deep understanding of the subject. When we start discussing an existing work or a subject to draw a new work from, the one question Bob always puts is, what is it about? Say it in one sentence. A difficult task for a dramaturg like me, we tend to talk a lot, not with Bob, Although there are exceptions. Let me tell you the story how I first met Bob. That was back in 2010 at the Opera House of Zurich. 
I had been admiring his work for decades, but never had the chance to work with him. I was appointed by the management to serve as his dramaturg for the production of Bellini's Norma. Having heard <clears throat> that Wilson has a tendency of being shy with a new collaborator he doesn't know yet, I told myself before the first meeting that I would not say a word. When we were all seated around the long table, he put the question, what is the overture of Norma about? No one dared to answer. After a long silence, I plucked up courage and began to talk, talk after all. I said the whole story of this opera is a confrontation between the male principle, pictured in a beam of sunlight, and the female principle, metaphorically expressed by the moon. Norma's famous prayer, Casta Dia, is directed to the goddess of the moon. This basic topic can be found musically in the overture. While I was pointing out which section would stand for which of the two principles, Bob had taken up his pencil and started drawing. After 10 minutes, I finished. And he shoved over a series of sketches, picturing what would happen in front of the closed curtain during the overture, asking, do you think this will work? And I enthusiastic, enthusiast, enthusiastically answered, perfectly well. He had translated my speech into images. The male principle was represented by straight lines, the female one by circles. Let me pick up another example of musical theater. In 2015, we had a production called Adam's Passion. It was based on music by Estonian composer Arvo Hert. The venue was the Noblesna Foundation in Tallinn, a former submarine shipyard, a hall of 40 meters by 60, huge. Bob had met Part in Rome at the Vatican when they both were invited for an audience with the Pope. Bob would say, I've always admired your music. I would love to stage something with it. And Part answered, I've always admired your theater please feel free to use any of it. During the workshop in Watermere, we would listen to a variety of pieces by Pert, and I would give Bob information on their structure. In fact, Pert's way of composing is strongly based on very abstract formal principles. One example, Tabula Rasa, a composition from 1977. It is structured, among other things, by a chord of the prepared piano that is played eight times. Each section of the of each section it opens is twice as long as the previous. So the moments when you hear the chord are stretched out in time. This is something Bob can immediately relate to. We also used a choral piece called Adam's Lament based on the text of the Russian monk Siluan. The set consisted of a stage with a saclorama as backdrop, typical for Wilson, and a sort of narrow runway stretching out into the audience. The main character, called a man, was again a dancer, the same who interpreted Oedipus, Mikhail Theopanos. He was naked. During the 20 minutes duration of the first section of the evening, he would walk in slow motion from far upstage to the very top of the runway, where he would pick up a tree branch with leaves for the next part. Adam's Lament tells the story of Adam after he has been driven out of paradise. The chorus expresses his feelings of guilt. Arvo Parrot assisted both the journal rehearsal and the opening night, after which he came to me asking very much upset, why did you change it? At the end of Adam's lament, Adam was kneeling down asking God for forgiveness. It didn't feel like that tonight. I said, well, all the actor does is picking up a tree branch. He did it during general rehearsal the same way he did it tonight. Harvold, who is a man of deep Christian faith, 
said he was not asking God to pardon him. No, he was picking up a brush. And the composer answered just as well. This story shows how every spectator can have their own associations about what they hear and see during a Wilson show. As Bob would say, I never try to tell the audience what they are supposed to feel or think. I am not interested in psychology on stage. I have no message. It's not about interpretation. I don't want to impose an idea on the spectator. It's up to them what they experience. Experience is a way of thinking. Zen philosophy tells us about this. I follow what I experience and I try to stay open. Another revolutionary feature of the theater of Robert Wilson. What a relief for the German playwright Heiner Miller when Wilson staged his drama Hamlet Machine back in 1986. At first in New York in English, then in Hamburg in the original German, both were students of a drama school. Müller had seen many interpretations of his play, trying to make sense of the phrases full of allusions, full of meaning. Most of these stagings only illustrating the text, bringing nothing new to it. What did Bob do? He invented a choreography of movements in a set with nothing but tables and chairs and a tree. Then he had this pattern repeated three times, each time rotating the set by 90 degrees. So you could see the identical movements of the group of actors four times, but each time from a different perspective. A totally abstract way, a, a totally abstract structure, at first sight in no relation to the play. Still, it resonated with the text in many ways, leaving anyone in the audience the freedom to have their own associations. Talking about text, when Bob was asked by the Schauspielhaus in the German city of Düsseldorf to create a new piece based on Oscar Wilde's novel, The Picture of Dorian Gray, he would turn to American author Daryl Pinkney. Daryl has been collaborating with Bob for many decades. He knew that it was out of the question to transform the plot of the novel into dialogue. In fact, there was to be only one actor, Christian Friedel known in the US as a movie actor, for example, in The Zone of Interest, where he played the main character. Daryl drew phrases from the novel, which he twisted in many ways. He also took extracts of letters from Oscar Wilde and poems of his lover, Alfred Douglas. The general idea was to tell a story about the painter and his model. We also incorporated the story of the famous painter Francis Bacon and his lover George Dyer, a burglar he surprised when he was breaking into this, his studio. Instead of calling the police, he asked him to become his model. The text Daryl came up with had three parts. In the first part, he used only sentences in past tense in the third person singular. He fell through the window and it gave him new life. The second part, all phrases were in present tense and first person singular. I look in the litter of tin tubes and dry brushes looking for my maker. And the third part, still in present tense, was in the second person singular. When you are not on your pedestal, you are not interesting. Thus, very simple basic structures, in this case grammatical ones, can also define a text. To finish my con contribution, let me draw your attention to another aspect of Robert Wilson's work. He says, my theater is a formal theater. For me, in theater, all elements are equally important. 
movement, dance, gesture, costume, maker, architecture, sculpture, design, light, words, music. All the arts come together in theater. You may call it Gesamtkunstwerk, like Richard Wagner did. That means that each of the cited elements has its own right and is treated independently. And it means no illustration. What one element expresses does not to have and does not have to be doubled by another element. If a scene is tragic, maybe the actor will play it with a smile and the scene has a bright look. As Bob says, black can be seen only against white. Life consists of contradictions. A Wilson show, therefore, is much more real than all the performances aiming at realism. Often I have heard Bob say to his actors, the stage is not a bus stop. You can't stand or walk on it the same way you do in the street. Indeed. Thank you for your, thank you for your attention.